Hello. Welcome, Paul, to our session. Hello. Um, Hello. Okay, I'm here. Yeah, no, no need to. You don't have to turn your camera on or um, right. feel feel free to come off mute though if you have questions as we uh, get into today. We are recording the session uh, for those that uh, can't join right at 10 uh, Pacific time. So um, also feel free to use the chat. If you have questions, you can use that if you don't want to come off mute, um, up to you. I'll just give it a couple of minutes to see um, if any other students log in live before we get going. Thanks Perfect. for coming. While we're waiting, Paul, do you um, tell me a little bit, how much do you know about uh, the viticulture side? I completed uh, WSET 2. Awesome. Uh, I work primarily as a um, curator for private collections. I've oh, never amazing. really worked. I've never really worked in in, uh, in vineyards. I got friends that work in vineyards or uh, own them. Um, over 12, 15 years of me working for uh, auctions and stuff like that, I've met a lot of people. Um, Very cool. But I'm just I'm just curious about what this was about. That's why I joined. Um, Great. Actually, Jessica was on a uh, a blind tasting that I participated mm. in about a week, a couple of weeks ago. And That's I first fun. knew about her from a previous blind testing during the pandemic. But um, I, I'm, I'm my job right now uh, in my company is is working on the like I said auctions, whether it's for their their wine collections or for, uh, clients. And right now I've uh, we've I branched off into um, uh, spirits, Scotch and um, and American whiskey, mm. so basically. But you know I I, I want to I want to keep myself my my options open. I want to see what's what's out there and. Love it. Here. Well, if you're the only one that ends up joining live, feel free to just chat away as we go. If there's any uh, particular area you want to focus on more, we can certainly personalize it a little bit. Um, I myself am uh, not a um, farmer and I don't grow vines. I do have a garden uh, and I do like to experiment uh, with tomato vines, which uh, believe it or not, actually do um, have very similar properties and suffer from similar illnesses. Uh, so it is kind of fun to uh, kind of mimic what uh, maybe um, those vine growers out there are dealing with. So why don't we just get started? And if anybody else joins, we'll just let them in. So I sort of tongue in cheek, but surviving is really hard work. You know, when we think about getting a glass of wine in front of us, I mean, it's grape juice, right? With a little bit more sassiness than grape juice uh but it seems like there's an abundance it seems like it's so straightforward and easy to uncork the bottle pour it and enjoy but the work it takes beyond just the wine making to ensure there's enough grapes to get it into the glass that's what we're going to cover today so we start here with just the basics of the anatomy of a basic uh vine so starting at the very bottom you've got your roots right? Underground. You have your root sock. If you are grafted on, you have the, the part there where the graft is, and then you have the scion, right? Which is building out this big, large, thick trunk, hopefully over time. Then you've got your arms or your cordons. The head is kind of right where it splits or creates shoulders, kind of how I, I think like your head sits on your shoulders, right? So you've got your, your shoulders, the arms, the head. Um, and then there's the canes that obviously are very, very important to us. The little spurs are after I cut off a cane, I have a spur left at the bottom. You see those on the left side. And then mm -hmm. on the canes, we have what we call the um, nodes. The internode is between them, uh, the buds. And the buds, of course, are going to break. And then you're going to have fabulous grapes, hopefully, in the future. So here we then extend um, our vine picture to looking more deeply at the vine itself where we have our nodes, our internodes, the tendrils are those little tiny vine looking things that kind of like can grab onto things. You see these in pea shoots also. 
The inflorescence is that kind of bundle that you see right here, uh, which is the clusters all of what will become a bunch of grapes in the, um, later in the season. We also have what is the most important, obviously the grapes because they lead to the wine, but the most important part um, I like to think of in a, an entire vine is the leaf itself. Uh, the leaf is the, the, the heart and the, the, I, I would like the, the beating heart of what keeps vines alive. So let's just take a look at the vine cycle. So uh, Wine Folly does this great uh, video graphic uh, that starts, obviously it moves very quickly. So I typed this up for us. Um, first, we've got our dormancy, which is what that prior picture kind of looks like, right? Where um, there is no greenery whatsoever in the dead of winter, whether you're in the North or the Southern hemisphere, the vine goes dormant and it looks, all, it's all brown, right? It's all the brown stuff, right? You do go through a pruning process in the winter. We're not gonna get into depth today. This is sort of a beginner's course on the various pruning and trellising methods, but ultimately you've got what's left over from the season that eventually going into winter will get pruned. Now, dormancy ends when the soil starts to warm up and the very beginning of the end of dormancy is when the sap starts to flow from the trunk, so the base, right, out to the arm and that's called weeping. And it literally, you can, if you catch it, right, uh, the sap actually flows and you can see it like seeping out of the, the wood. Then you have bud break or burst, right? This is the buds from the nodes. Uh, they're using the stored carbs from the winter. The shoot then forms and then the leaves form and photosynthesis begins. And that's why I think um, the leaves are oh so most important is because of photosynthesis. So we'll dig into that just in a sec. So flowering, Roughly 40 to 80 days from bud break is when flowering will occur. Then you have your pollination because now we have flowers. Flowers have pollen, right? They are self-pollinating vines, which it means we don't actually need bees. We just need a light breeze, right? The pollen will move around, um, which here is your kind of one of your first points of uh, surviving is really hard. Um, outside of surviving winter is then the fact that if we have a heavy rain or consistent rain, or a wind, heavy wind, not a breeze, we can just get rid and lose all pollen. Right. And so if you actually are a gardener of any kind, this is like the bane of your existence is you have this like, right now we're based in Vegas here, that is an interesting uh, early springish thing going on. We're in the 60s as, as our highs during the day. And all of a sudden the trees are starting to have bud break. Now, what happens in Vegas uh, as we lead into the spring months is the windy season. Well, the windy season comes at the worst possible time because it can blow and knock off all the flowers. It can knock off early fruit and it can knock off pollen. So if you grow cucumbers or you grow tomatoes and things that you need to have pollen available for flowering to fruit, you can have very lush green stuff and absolutely produce nothing. So pollination is um, a very sensitive window of time. Then you have your fruit set, another very sensitive time for the vine. Um, this is when you're transitioning. You go from the flower to those little tiny green berries, and we can have issues of color or um, millerangish, and I can never pronounce it correctly, so apologies on my French pronunciation, <laughs> but I will get into, I'll show you pictures of what that actually looks like. Then if we're lucky enough to actually get to full ripening berries, verasion starts to occur. You see this mostly on the black grapes where they go from green and they start to turn uh, reddish, purple, right? They get into a different color. Whereas your green grapes or white grapes will actually become a little bit more golden when likely translucent. So they actually kind of lose color if you think of it that way, or they go from a green to a red, purple, black color. So verasion is the ripening and the color change process. And then we hope, we pray, we do our rain dance, whatever we need to do um, to ensure that we get all the way to harvest. So from the time of the color change, we're talking, we have one and a half to two months of fingers crossing that we don't get heavy rains, which can plump up our grapes and make them dilute, or that we don't get a frost, or we don't get hail, or we don't have a fire, like so many things that can impact us just getting a reasonable yield for the winemaker to then produce its luxurious wine and make money. So the whole process from bud break to harvest, on average, 
140 to 160 days. Um, so let's just break it down a little bit further. Dormancy, here's a, a great shot of some vines here. You can see basically dormancy, all brown. Everything going on is asleep. And it is minimal water now flowing through the vine. The canes and buds have hardened off and it's conserving its energy from last spring. So literally think of energy as food, food in this case being carbohydrates. The carbs, it's like right before a race, people say they carb load. Well, spring, right, of the prior year, they actually carb load for the winter coming. So they conserve and store that up into the trunk, into the roots. And the first sign, like I mentioned, is that weeping when the ground temperature gets above 50. For bud break, sorry, these are images are a little cutting off here a bit. So the on the right hand side, you can see the bud is this. You can see here there's a blurred vision of it right there. And then it starts to burst open. And the first signs of, of life again are the leaves. So it is sucking up those carbs. So again, like I'm like a marathon runner night before my race, I'm like sucking down all my noodles. Well, the vine is sucking up all of its carbs from the bottom up. The bud starts to swell, then it breaks and the shoot starts to emerge from the node. And this is super sensitive again, because guess what? If like currently in Vegas, and I think the Midwest right now, I think it's had its warmest winter on record. If the temperatures, are right enough in February, you could have, like I have fig trees right now who are going through bud burst. If I get a cold snap, like one frost night or freeze, and I don't take care to do something that warms up that tree, the vine, a plant, doesn't matter. They literally will freeze, frost, bite, die, black, fall off. I just, if I lose all of my buds, right? Chances are I might not lose all of them because of just the situation of how they're placed. One might get warmer, get more sun, or, you know, there's such intricacies on that whole cane. But the idea here that I can really damage both the vine and I can lose my buds and I can really significantly reduce yield, right? Lower yield means less grapes, which means less money um, in the end. So hopefully... Perfect spring, there's absolutely no hail, no frost, no cold snaps. It's a normal, normal spring. The shoots actually start to get really strong and the leaves form and photosynthesis begins. Now, photosynthesis is, for those that are not in uh, chemistry majors or you know, didn't go through biology, you know, in last time you saw it was like high school or something, it can be a little complicated. So the way I like to remember it, first off, photosynthesis, drives the growth of the vine. If you have no photosynthesis, literally means the vine will die. Not maybe immediately, but it will effectively die. There's no way for it to make new energy and it needs the energy to stay alive. So in order to think about photosynthesis in a simplified way for me, I think of it as like breathing. So we have to, we know we need to make energy, right? For those leaves to sprout because we've sucked all our storage up of carbohydrates from last year as the vine starts to produce leaves. But those leaves are now available to say, I can create more energy. I can make more carbohydrates. How I do that is effectively by breathing. It's really easy for a plant, any plant, not just a vine. So what the plant on the left here looks like is that you have, imagine your leaves are breathing, they inhale. What they do are they are sucking up CO2 from the atmosphere, water, and nutrients and minerals from the roots, sucking that in. So like taking a big breath, they use the light and the heat from sun to then convert that into sugar and exhale oxygen. So I think of it as the respiration process is the breaking down of the sugar into energy for growth. So there actually is a chemical conversion, right? That's occurring from CO2 and water plus sun and heat converts to sugar. And then we break the sugar down into energy. Now, the rate of us increasing sugar actually in the grapes itself, once they formed, is directly related to the amount of photosynthesis. So this, I have a lot of weight and heat, and I can, I start making sugar very quickly, right? It's because I'm going through rapid photosynthesis. 
also during this time, aroma compounds are also made within the vine, which is where all our delightful characteristics come from. For photosynthesis to occur, there are a set of crazy requirements. Again, no photosynthesis equals death. And in order to prevent death, we have to have temperatures that range from 64 to 91 degrees. It, it is outside of that range, right? It will slow if it's cooler than 50, not stop completely. If it's above 95 degrees, it will slow. And the ideal, optimal for the rate of it to be optimized, right, for the whole vine life cycle is between a small window, 70 to 85 degrees. The sunlight, you need more than a third of full sun. So you don't need full direct sun, but you need at least a third, right, of full sun at some point in the day. And then if it's less than that, you need longer days in order for enough sun to help the plant convert. Um, now that means that cloudy days aren't great. Um, some are good. Uh, clouds can be great throughout the day, but if you had a completely cloudy season, that would really, really impact the vine's rate of photosynthesis. Um, shade is another one. So depending on where you plant your vine, if it's completely in the shade, you're not gonna produce a very productive vine. And that would be the same if it was tomatoes or cucumbers, right? If you give it only partial sun or not nearly as much sun, you might get a little baby plant. You might get lucky if you got like a little piece of fruit, but it would not be highly productive. You also need water. You don't need necessarily tons of water. We'll talk about the minimum it needs, but it does need some amount of water, right? As you see on the bottom there, because you need the water to help the mineral and nutrients dissolve to be sucked up and digestible to the plant. Um, so a lack of water will actually reduce or stop and stunt the growth of the vine and slow ripening and also could lead to death. The green part, most important part required for photosynthesis. So if you have some reason that your leaves start to turn yellow, Yellow leaves will stop photosynthesis, also breaking down the entire process, reducing yields, making you less money. Um, yellowing leaves can come from a bunch of scenarios, and we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, virus, fungus, diseases, good stuff, right? I mean, if the plant hasn't, if it's made it this far, there's so many more things that effectively can cause a crisis. There's one, one more step here that I want to talk about is... Um, respiration, and then something called transpiration. All of this is occurring through the back of the leaf. These, So I literally think of it as breathing because on the back of the leaf, now again, this is like microscopic. So under a microscope, you see what looks to me like little mouths. So you have these little mouths on the back of the leaves that are breathing. They like open or they close um, or they close completely or they just close slightly. And those are the stomata. So the little mouths are what inhales, like sucks in the CO2, it can exhale oxygen, but they also can sweat. So transpiration is my equivalent of the plant sweating. So if a plant sweats, it means that the plant's letting the water out of the plant, as well as the oxygen, right, exhaled, that's diffusing out of the stomata, that triggers the vine to pull more water up from the soil. So as it's sweating out, it's releasing water out. It's like weeping water, it's panting basically, right? Imagine your dog panting, right? Like a plant can pant, right? In a sort of way. Evapotranspiration rate. It suggests that if the amount of transpiration occurring from the vine and the evaporation of water from the soil surface, the rate at which that water is no longer available it has been consumed by the vine or it's lost to the atmosphere. Hot, dry, drought, windy climate, winds will evaporate it from the soil is the evapotranspiration rate. A high rate of evapotranspiration means that the vine needs much more water because it's losing it at a quicker pace or it's consuming it at a quicker pace. So what happens if there is not water available? First, the plant will pant, right? It will start it will start exhaling, if you will, and losing water and oxygen quickly, causing the vine to become stressed out, right? Imagine you're a runner or your dog, you pant, you, your body is in some form of stress, right? Vines, plants, same thing. Now, the stomata will then try to course correct by partially closing or completely closing in order to trap what water it has left. Under very extreme conditions, this will also stop photosynthesis because 
the conversion isn't happening. If I can't release the oxygen, right, and I close the stomata, I can't breathe in CO2. So in that case, leaves will actually fall off. And again, possibly the, di the vine could die. At a minimum, it's going to reduce yields, which means the winemaker is going to make less money. What can you do to avoid water stress? Well, if you have the ability to irrigate, which I'm sure most of you are aware, um, different laws in place as to whether irrigation is permitted or only permitted in extreme circumstances. Um, you can plant drought tolerant root stocks. Um, some of the varieties themselves can just with hand the stress like Grenache um, is like a drought friendly vine in and of itself, or you could use drought friendly root stocks um, for your vineyard if you know you're in a drier climate. So with climate changing, there are certainly um, vineyards out there that are shifting what they plant and shifting what kind of rootstock they're using in preparation for uh, less water. Now the opposite, what if you have a low evapor um, evapotranspiration rate? That means that the vine actually just needs less water. That would be typical in a very cool or humid climate. Translocation, you have another big word to remember, is final metabolic process where the materials are moved from one part of the plant to another. So for example, sugar from the leaves go to the shoot tips or sugars that are not needed for energy to keep the vine alive are actually then moved to the grape once they show up in the life cycle. Or those that sugar can be moved and stored in the woody part, again, for future roots, meaning the following spring. So once we've gotten through bud break, and we've successfully have leaves that are using photosynthesis and we are creating energy, we're either storing some of it, we're making um, you know, uh, more leaves, we're growing our shoot. We now get to a place where an inflorescence can form. On the left side here, this is like the, kind of the best picture I could find, and sorry, it's a little blurry, to, it's uh, kind of blowing it up so you could really try to see it. These little clusters on the left, they have the cap still on them, the little tiny, uh, soon to be berries, right? Then you see the inflorescence, the cluster starts to bloom. And so you have these like little tiny flower spikes that are coming out. Uh, then you have in picture C where the berry itself is starting to um, set. And then off to the right, you could say, this is what they look like once they set. They're a little bit more enlarged. You can see that there's a little less of them. Um, and you can truly start to identify a true berry formation at this point. So the Blaine, flowers, can I ask you a question? What's, of course. What's, yeah. what's, how long does that normally take? Oh, the 40 Four, days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 40, to, 40 to 80. So I always think it's like a month and a half, right? If you try to think of it in terms of months um, to, to just about, you know, almost three months, two and a half months. Um, it needs a minimum of 63 degrees Fahrenheit. It needs sun, water, the nutrients for a very fruitfulness of buds. Uh, in the next growing season. So like, I am not only worried about what I'm doing right now is on the vine, but I'm also worrying about how much I'm going to need energy wise for the next season so that my buds are very fruitful. And so pollen actually needs the sweet spot of 79 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit for it to be available to a vine. And so you can see here on the right side, pollen's like the little pretty uh, golden little balls falling down um, to hit the to hit the pollen tube. Uh, you have the stamen with the anth anther and the filament, which is that structure on the left side of the picture. So what's interesting is if you look at this part of the vine flower, you see a little, I think they look like eyeballs, but they're eggs in, inside um, an actual, so it's like the egg, and then you have an ovule, and then the ovary of the flower, and then you have your pollen tube. Now that pollen tube that sticks up that allows for the pollen and the egg to be fertilized, that pollen tube can be easily impacted if it gets really cold, right? Uh, if it rains heavily uh, and or heavy wind, right? Can just snap it off, can just completely, completely break it, which means that I can't fertilize the egg, which means that I cannot make seeds, which means, and the list goes on of all the things I can't do, um, as a vine, so that it would cause reduced yields and less money to be made. So each flower fertilized becomes a grape. Um, low temp lengthens the flowering process, 
which can cause an uneven ripening later. So if we were to go back to this picture here, you can see um, on picture B, everything kind of looks consistent. When you look at picture C and then D, you can see that there is different sizes going on, right, for the berry formation. And that can be a problem. Imagine a cluster of, of grapes where, you know, each grape is of a different size and some are still green while others are in Verasian. That would be very bad because, I mean, it's not the worst thing, but it, it's not great because you can imagine harvest. I don't really want really high acidic grapes. That might mean I have to hand harvest by berry, not cluster. Certainly increases labor costs, um, time, and, and the additional investment means if, can I make a quality of wine that's going to recoup that kind of money? Big question mark, right? Um, note, again, they're self-pollinating, so we don't need bees or birds or anything. We just need basically stable weather. Um, and effectively about, in good conditions, 30% of flowers will become pollinated and form a grape. So it's very uncommon to get 100% of your flowers actually surviving enough to actually get 100% grape. Um, Seeds begin to form along with the grape in the middle of the berry um, during cell division. But if you're not able to pollinate um, and obviously you don't make the grape and you don't have seeds, then um, if they were propagated through like seeds actually planting the grape berry and growing a vine, like prehistoric times, like you plant a seed, that's how you could get it. Nowadays, we obviously don't really grow um, our vines in that way. So a little less of a concern but still a problem ultimately. Um, so rain, winds, cold and clouds, risky business. Here's where we see the two big conditions that can occur that reduce yield during flowering pollination fruit set. So calor, uh, the picture of the purple grape uh, there on the right-hand side is also known as shatter. It causes poor fruit set because the flowers fail to fully develop um, into the actual berry. So the ovule unsuccessfully fertilized. And so you could see there these like, um, I don't know if you could see my mouth, but like there's these like almost like they look charred. Like, so instead of forming a black grape, you've got these little tiny, what used to be, and then they're like kind of like, uh, they look like as if you pulled the grape off, it's actually just getting kind of charred and nasty looking. So you can imagine if I had rows and rows of, of clusters like this, how much less grape and grape juice the quality of my grape juice and how important that would be for me to have enough volume that year to actually make what I expect as a business um, to make every, uh, through the year. Um, the next disease issue, not disease, an issue here would be those seeds, right? Having less seed development, so seedless grapes, which end up being actually smaller than grapes with seeds. So it isn't terribly detrimental to the, the life. But what the problem is, is that they can be, um, they call these sometimes, I think, hen and chicks, but like you think of mamas and babies, um, you've got your seeded grapes, which are fuller and plumper and have more juice, more volume than the small ones. Sometimes they can be so small that there's nothing that you can get out of them. So it's major impact on yield. This occurs when, again, during pollination, it's cold, it's wet, or it's windy, um, especially Chardonnay and Merlot are quite susceptible to um, Millerange, um, however you might pronounce that effectively if you had a great French accent. The next step in the life cycle, we talk Verasian and harvest. So you could see here, here is black grapes during Verasian. So you can see they're green and they're starting to get that pale purple lavender color. Um, the berries both enlarge, the skin starts to soften and thin out. Um, the water is flowing from the xylem now, and that starts to slow. Sugar and water move out to the grape via the phloem. It's another anatomy part of the, of the vine. Um, so I would say, AK, this is your sugar water accumulation in berries. While the tartaric acid concentration now is starting to degrade, malic acid falls because it is used in that respiration instead of sugar now. So if I'm going to start using sugars to make my berries fuller and riper, I need something else to help my respiration, my breathing process. It turns to malic acid to do that. Um, now, white skins, as we mentioned, become translucent. They don't truly change color. They actually get thinner, uh, softer, and more see-through. Um, and obviously, you know what happens with the black skin. Now, harvest, about a month and a half, two, two months after this process starts, the grapes are ripening in sugar, 
and phenolic. So your tannins start to polymerize and they become less bitter. Your anthocyanins or the, the color in your black grapes increases. Flavor and aroma compounds like your terpenes start to rise. Your methoxypyrazine starts to fall. So um, depending on human factors, uh, like the style of wine you want looking to make, um, logistics, which can be, do I even have the human labor? Do I have the equipment ready if I'm sharing it or renting it? Um, or nature, right? Is there a threat of rain or threat of frost? All will dictate the time in which the berries are being picked. And over a course of time or in one instance, um, all of those factors affect on that actual date. Now, leaves will then start to drop and the carbohydrate reserves are starting to be stored in the woody parts, the roots, the trunk, and the branches. And then the vine will effectively go dormant assuming the temperatures cooperate. So anatomy and the life cycle, just to highlight several areas where we have severe risk for damage or death of the vine or grape uh, that reduce yield, reducing volume, causing for the um, seller of the juice or the winemaker to have less financial opportunity um, going at the end of that season or future seasons if they're storing their wine. Are there any questions anybody has or anything anybody wants to put in chat before we talk about the actual requirements the vine has to have life beyond photosynthesis. I'm good. Cool. This is this is good. This is a good review for me. Awesome. Any anybody else out there? Don't be shy. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, otherwise, I'll keep plowing through. Uh, so, vine requirement. This is a again a little bit more science heavy. Let's just plow through them. Um, nutrients, nitrogen. Okay, this impacts the vigor and grape quality. Abundance of nitrogen yields too much greenery, hinders ripening. Why? Because if I create too much shade in the canopy, again, I needed that sunlight. Deficiencies of nitrogen reduces vigor, yellows the leaves. What do yellow leaves do? Not allow for photosynthesis. And it can also cause fermentation issues. Potassium. This is, you think potassium is, we think bananas, right? For a muscle, uh, for uh, the vine, it's essential for growth and regulating water flow. So um, if you have too much potassium, you actually impact the uptake of magnesium. You reduce yield, you have poor ripening, and it will cause high levels in the grapes, which then affects the quality as it's linked to your pH in the musk. And then if you have not enough potassium, low sugar accumulation, which reduces yields and poor growth, but low sugar accumulation also just means highly acidic, right? Phosphorus, you just need a tiny amount for photosynthesis to occur. If you don't have enough poor root systems, and that impacts the ability to drink or inhale up the nutrients and water, suns growth, suns yield, and could actually lead to death. Calcium is about the plant cell structure. So think of calcium for us as bones, not the plants have bones, but it's like the structure, the sturdiness comes from calcium, um, also required for photosynthesis. And if you have not enough, it's very rare, but it can happen. It has a negative impact on the fruit set and impact yield. And then you've got magnesium, which is in chlorophyll, the greening of leaves um, or, or the, the vine stalk. Any part green derived by chlorophyll is required for photosynthesis. Remember, green parts drive that equation. And so if you don't have enough, obviously reduces yield, impacts ripening. Next up, we have what are the factors, though, like the natural factors that can impact the nutrient uptake. So it's one thing to like maybe not have enough of them or have too much. If we don't have water, these are soluble in water. So they get diluted and that's how we drink it in or inhale it up from my roots into the vine. So if I don't have water, those nutrients become unavailable. The soil, critical. The pH itself is key because some nutrients become more or less available at various pHs. For example, um, basic soils, that means a very high number pH, actually causes iron to be less available, leading to chlorosis. This is a very common issue if you are somewhere in Vegas because we have basically bedrock as soil. And so to try to plant green living plants that produce fruit can be really tough unless you augment the soil for the pH. Otherwise, you have yellow plants like citrus trees with yellow leaves. No more photosynthesis. It will eventually die. Um, 
organic compounds in the soil or added to it, so you can uh, you know, control that a bit through farming, if they're not readily available, um, we need to be converting those into like in inorganic compounds. So we need the organic stuff to be created into an inorganic compound that allows for us to uh, basically the vine to leverage it, to use it. The process of going from organic to inorganic happens with worms. So other organisms too, but worms are the ones we can visually see. Others are fairly microscopic. There are actually positive nematodes out there, um, microscopic in nature that also contribute to breaking down the carbon and making it available. Um, mineralization is the name of the process, but ultimately just think you have horse manure, organic compounds, you gotta have it converted into inorganic to break down that carbon to make it available. The texture of the soil, believe it or not, has an impact on the holding capacity of both water and the nutrients and minerals. So clay soil, for example, very fine texture, the way you think of that as Play-Doh, it's very good for holding together, it's very sticky, which means it can absorb and also hold water and nutrients and lock it into place. A sandy soil, though, seems odd to say is large particles, but it's just very coarse in texture. If you think of sand, it's coarse when you rub it on your hands. It's good for drainage. Um, people will add hummus to it, or humus, depending on how you say it, in, into the soil to increase its holding capacity. So it's giving it some smaller texture into the larger texture to both allow for drainage and um, collecting moisture at the same time, so an appropriate balance. Um, tomatoes are a great example. If you are on the East Coast, the Eastern Shore sandier soils produce some of the best tomatoes because tomatoes are vines and they don't love tons of water. They don't want to sit in water. They don't want a heavy moisture. Um, color impacts the sunlight exposure. So lighter color reflects light back into the canopy. So that can be helpful in a cooler or a shadier spot. Um, and then darker colored radiate heat at night, which can be great if there is um, a high diurnal range or some places where the temperatures can drop potentially to a risky low level, then it offsets that. Um, the topography, uh, this means like slopes, right, versus flat surface. On slopes, there's thinner soil and therefore it's less fertile. So the question here, type it in or if you just shout it out, do we want vines to grow on very fertile soils? Mm. Not exactly. Yeah, you don't really, because if we yeah. have very, very fertile soils, we'll just keep producing greenery all the time and forget about making berries. Man, I'm just having a great time producing more and more leaves. So, right, we don't really want um, we don't really want that fertile soil. We want the vine to struggle a bit uh, right. because it helps actually concentrate the flavor into the grape. The That's growing what I explained. I explained that last night. Somebody was talking about Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh and yeah. There's a difference. There's a difference between an apatase and uh Paso Robles. I said Paso Robles is more of a drier uh, environment, whatever. And I explained yeah. to them how the the the, the uh, roots struggle and push down looking for water, and that's what yep. gives the uh, Sauvignon Blanc at uh, the Cabernet Cabernet the, the awesome. power and the strength that it has. And he's uh, looking at me with his eyes open. I said, "Here, go, go, to, wine, go to wine folly." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so growing environment is another biggie. Um, it impacts natural resources. Um, it's actually a very defining effect on wine produced in a vine's ability to thrive, right? So what do I mean by the growing environment? Well, some will say terroir. Uh, French word comes from the word um, terre or terre, which means land. Um, there's actually no single agreed upon definition. Sense of place is often thrown around, uh, which means the wine shows the character related to where it's grown. Uh, that could be climate, soil, aspect, altitude, latitude, water, weather, elevation. Some also include winemaker interventions such as um, planting density, trellising, laws that control irrigation or not. All of that could be terroir to some people. What really impacts natural resources um, is either climate and or weather. So climate is just the annual pattern of temperature, sun, rain, humidity, and wind, historic averages right? Doesn't really change year to year. Your climate is this, right? Weather, but weather is a meteorologi meteorological condition that does vary day to day or week to week or month by month. Um, it's the state of atmosphere actually in a specific place and time inclusive of humidity, heat, sun hours, wind, rain, hail, drought, snow. Um, and the biggest factors 
um, on vintage variation is the weather versus the climate. Now we know climate is ultimately changing, which actually can infect um, not just vintage, but it affects actual the, the varietals that we're growing, but weather is what causes vintage variation. Now there are various forms of climate. Um, I like to use this picture for myself. I'm gonna go big to small, moving uh, the opposite way you normally do, right to left. So macro climate would be like the whole region, right? Mesoclimate would refer to a smaller area than macro, but likely like the whole, a whole vineyard. So you could see that there's like maybe more than a couple of vineyards photographed here. And then the microclimate could actually mean a couple of rows within a vineyard, just based on how the land and where it's planted or how the row is planted and how it's oriented. All of that can actually create, you could have like trees on one side of that of a couple of rows that aren't on the other side, right? Like there's all sorts of factors here that drive actually uh, a meso to a microclimate where 10 rows down act very different than the, the ones at the top of this hill. So this brings in a very complicated topic that we don't have to cover um, a ton about, but it's here for reference, um, is the classifications of climate. Most systems are focusing on temp and some include rain, because of the influence on the life cycle that we talked about earlier. Growing degree days, this also is, uh, you may recognize it from Winkler zones. Um, one, um, zone one is the lowest uh, growing days versus the um, a five is the highest. It is a formula that you have to consider the average, uh, the average temperature of a month in the growing season, subtracting 50 degrees because of the dormancy you multiply it by the number of days in a month, and then you do that for all the growing months, sum it together, and you get your number of growing degrees days, right? Super complicated as a mouthful. And of course, any month that actually had a negative value is not counted. Um, it's, a, it's complicated to talk about, but honestly, what we're looking at is trying to figure out the averages to be whether it's gonna be a hotter or a colder uh, particular area. Huglin index is similar to that. It's used heavily in Europe. Um, and it ranges in a way that tells you what grapes are suitable to a particular region. And the difference is it also includes maximum temperatures during growing season and longer day and length for those that are at a higher latitude. The average temperature of the warmest month, also known as January, July, depending on your, um, the hemisphere you're in. Um, so MJT is its acronym. There are six bands that go from cold to very hot. It considers continentality, humidity, and hours of sun. GST is the average of growing season grouped into bands from cold to hot, similar to the growing degree days. Coben's classification, loosely based on this, is what you are most commonly seeing um, referenced in any of your wine studies. And it classifies our wine regions into maritime, Mediterranean, continental, and then tacks on a temperature class like cool, moderate, warm, and hot. Um, you could spend time getting into these, uh, into the nitty gritty. I like to just remember maritime sounds like sailing. It means close to ocean, right? And it has an impact, meaning there's very small temp difference between summer and winter, and it rains throughout the year. Mediterranean, also similarly near a body of water, but the humidity is lower and it rains simply in the fall and the winter, but the degree swing in temp is also small. Continental, away from water. By being away from water, summer's shorter, winter's colder and longer, um, and it's typically um, a large temperature difference between summer and winter. For what influences weather and or climate, whoops, sorry, is obviously sun, temp, fog, humidity, precipitation as in snow or rain, wind, the soil which regulates water supply, drainage, and fertility, latitude, altitude, mountain slopes, aspects, and large bodies of water. So if we just look at temperature and sunlight, it impacts sugar and acid balance. Warmth and light are required for what process have we talked about? Photosynthesis. 100%. Impact of various temperatures during that vine life cycle, right? We talked about the idea for pollination. There's an ideal window for verasion and harvest. So less than 50 degrees ensures we go into dormancy. There are some climates where getting to 50 could be risky, which means it doesn't go into dormancy and it needs a whole lot car more carbohydrate energy because it never really sleeps and rests, right? Um, negative four degrees is freezing of the vine, damage and or my skeleton death. Um, 50 degrees we've covered is bud break. Um, these were already covered in prior slides, but I grouped them in case you decide to use these for your, your studies. 
Do you need intensely full sunlight? No. Right. Limiting factor is less than a third full sun. Would fog increase or decrease our rate of photosynthesis? Hmm. Because fog blocks the sun. I'm going to think it will decrease. Yep. Exactly. Then we have moisture. Lots of ways it could come at us. Vine needs about 20 to 30 inches a year, so it doesn't actually need a ton. But it's best to get it when it's dormant in the winter to increase the groundwater. Um, and then maybe during growing season, it is not great during uh, flowering. It's not great during harvest. Hail, absolute killer, yeah, yeah. damages the vine, right? Breaks off things, uh, whether it's leaves or the grapes itself or flowers, like it's terrible. Humidity, good and bad. Uh, fungus and mold degrade great quality, may require fungicides, which increases time, money, and labor, and lower yield. Now, there is good rot, like noble rot or botrytis. That requires, though, the afternoons to be dry and sunny to prevent it from turning into bad rot. Fog, also plus and minus, reduces temperatures in a vine, in the vineyard, I should say. Um, and sunlight, it's good for hot climate, bad for cool ones. So a very hot climate, it keeps them nice and cool in the morning, maybe, um, or uh, coming into the late afternoon, depending on its location. Increase of humidity is good if it burns off later in the day. Uh, otherwise, it does lead to mold and spoilage. Now, winds, pros and cons, it's in low hum it's, it creates low humidity, which reduces the threat of pests, less spraying, obviously less cost, protects yields. In hotter climate, it cools the vine. That's a plus. But if it's during flowering and pollination, we talked about that impact yield. If it um, it's really high. It can increase that evapotranspiration rate, causing water stress if I don't have a water supply available. And high winds can actually damage the vine. I may need to plant windbreaks, which are expensive. Um, obviously, southern France, we have the Mistral winds. Um, these can dictate the type of trellising, training, and pruning. And you see over here on the right, like a basket train, where everything's going to try to grow inside the basket so the winds themselves blow over the vine without damaging it. Latitude is another biggie. We have our sweet spot, right, where those golden orange bands are. Um, closer to the equator is hotter, consistent daylight hours, more solar radiation, which means more sugar, less acid, riper flavors, and phenolic. The pineapple is the tropical zone where it's too hot, humid, not good for growing. Our penguins, too cold, not enough sunlight, et cetera, at those in the poles, so not good for growing. And then our higher latitudes, have longer days, cooler nights, shorter growing seasons, and the risk of frost or freeze. So that's your 30th to your 50th. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the degrees marked. Now, altitude, temps fall 1.1 degree Fahrenheit for every 100 meters above sea level. The higher your elevation, the cooler it is, often windier, which can be a pro if you have low latitude. So if you're in a warmer area, but a high altitude, you're getting cooler and windier, which cools the vine instead of it being so hot that you can't actually grow. Um, many of our high latitude sites are at those lower altitudes. Um, just thinking about that because the temps would then be maybe too cold for ripening. Less fog, so botrytis would not be found in a high altitude place. Higher diurnal range or shift at night protects acid so it doesn't get overly ripe, given the UV radiation is much more intense, which is great for our photosynthesis and promoting the synthesis of both tannins and anthocyanins. Um, from a mountain perspective, this is creating shelter in some cases. It creates a large diurnal range. It also creates something called the rain shadow effect. I've, these are great examples here um, in, in Washington. So you can see on the right, so think about it as like the one side of the Cascade Mountains versus maybe um, the other side. You've got on the west side of the mountains, you've got Puget Sound, wet, cool. On the other side, you have Columbia Valley. You've got the irrigation actually being needed. It's like considered high desert and it's within the same area, but that means that the moisture isn't getting up and over the mountains. So one side gets all of it, the other side gets none. Um, and there are pros and cons of that, depending on the varietals that you've planted, right, can be adapted to that um, wetter climate, cooler climate versus hot and dry. Now, the slope and the aspect, uh, this is a shot from the Mosul um, on the left here, you can see very steep. So if we're in the northern hemisphere, things face south, 
right? Because it gets the most sun. So if you think about the global picture, right? The Northern hemisphere, we're pointing south, we're gonna get most of the sun. That's great in a cooler region. It's a minus if it's a hotter, if it's a hotter region. In the Southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. Now, east facing vines, you can, you can plant your rows east facing. And that would mean that the sun itself is strong in the morning and is getting that to warm up the heat, I'm uh, sorry, warm up the soil and the air temperature uh, when it is typically coming off of night, right, at its lowest time. It extends the hours of the growing and the ripening season if it's in a cool climate. Now, it also can dry the vine out from dew in the morning, which could accumulate lowering, um, you know, the risk of fungal disease by having it face eastward. Now, if you face westward, um, it gets hot afternoon sun. There is a risk of sunburn in warmer climates, but can be good if it's in a, um, say, in a cooler, uh, requires um, hotter uh, temperatures to really extend the ripening. Now, steepness of slopes, that's a mouthful, um, actually matters more. So in high latitude vineyards, because solar radiation hits at a low angle. So we need more light and warmth, spring and fall, right, to extend that growing season. So Burgundy, um, Alsace Grand Cru sites are southeast facing slopes um, versus flat sites because ripeness is greater, um, as in it's more, you know, your concentration. Um, runoff and drainage, less nutrients and erosion risk. Um, it means that the soils on steeper slopes are thin and less fertile. So water hits, it erodes, it all runs downhill, which means the vines on some of the best sites are planted on steeper slopes, also because the vine struggles. And by it using its roots to go find nutrients and water, right, it helps to concentrate, um, a greater concentration and better ripeness, which creates a uh, potentially better wine. Large bodies of water, big deal. This can make or break uh, based on um, the health of a vine, based on what type of climate we have. So temperature of water changes much more slowly than dirt. Larger bodies slow to change um, than smaller. So it means that once they cool down, they take a long time to warm up. And once they're warm, they take a long time to cool down, which is a good thing if you're in the Finger Lakes of New York and your, your body of water, right? takes a long time to cool down, which means it can radiate warmth as the air temperature is actually dropping, extending uh -huh. the growing season. As it does in the Rangel region. In, uh... Yep, exactly. Yeah. Source of humidity, fog, clouds, rain, obviously. Um, so what, right? Vines planted in a hot or cold uh, climate can get a prolonged season based on that large body of water cooling things off or heating things up. Diurnal swing is also less extending kind of your, um, your growing season. Vines at the same latitude, right? So they're planted at the same, same latitude, like on your 30 or your 50 degree, right? With water nearby, we'll have summers that are not as hot and winters that are not as cold, preventing frost and freeze versus those without a large body of water. So it's like all things consistent, right? It's going to enable successful production where another may not be so because there's not a body of water. An example of this in my own life is that I have tomato plants in Vegas, which in the winter does drop below 50 degrees, which means dormancy. I, I have a pool. The pool is considered a large body of water, right, comparatively to my little tomato vines. It gets, it keeps the temperature from drop, when it drops below freezing at night, doesn't kill my vine. Now, it still goes into dormancy, but I have flowering and fruit set two months sooner because of that body of water than I would if I didn't have it. So... Um, just incre increasing hang time. It can also cool a vine, which can slow sugar accumulation in a warmer place. So there's a lot of benefits of being near a body of water. Now, we've talked about the vine life cycle and all the chemistry behind it, but now there are a bunch of other things that can effectively kill a vine or at least damage it severely. Starting with a fungus, this is powdery mildew. Um, it can damage you can see pictures here, can damage the leaf. By the way, powdery mildew, taking up greenery, less photosynthesis, less yield, right? And the list goes on. This is actually a picture of downy powdery uh, mildew on the grapes themselves. You see they're splitting, cracking, breaking. I can't harvest that and get anything great out of it, right? Especially from any kind of volume. I lose my whole crop, then, then what? Um, downy mildew, uh, you see here the browning, they get thin, they get crackly, they break, they puncture holes. 
it's a disaster. Gray rot, this is what that looks like. Botrytis is the good rot. So this is a case where I might uh, hand harvest and pick those babies off because they're going to be fabulous to taste and actually make me more money. But if it doesn't have those dry, sunny days to look to get like this, it turns like that. And we're not in a place where there's anything delicious and you don't want to make anybody sick. Eutipa dieback is a fungus actually for the trunk and they call this dead arm. This is a great picture of that. So you can see like what kind of volume am I going to get off of that? What's my yield going to look like? How am I going to make any money? And how old is that vine uh, that I to suffer in this way from this fungus now? Um, we're not even going to get into the details of what I could do to like prevent this or help or in cases where I can't prevent it. But you can see how I would be significantly impact financially. So Mopsis cane and leaf spot, you can see that here again, we're removing green, the less green, less photosynthesis, less yield, list goes on. Obviously this can turn eventually damage break um, and I have less of a plant to even deal with. Esca, uh, this is like an easy one. I don't know why, I just always think of Esca and tiger print. I, I don't know, makes no sense I'm sure to you, but Esca is always an easy one to diagnose when you see this pattern, kind of like a zebra look. Um, then we have not just that, we have bacteria which is awesome. Like fungus is just being transferred in the air, right? Now we have bacteria uh, created, brought to us by infected things like leaf hoppers, like insects. So grapevine yellow, again, yellowing, no, no way to have good photosynthesis, impact fields production. So those darn little leaf hoppers come and infect my vine and I get grapevine yellow. Or I have phylloxera, these lovely little aphid looking life type creatures that are basically sucking the life out of the vine. This is actually on a leaf, but can start at the base of the trunk. We know how terrible phylloxera is um, in terms of just successful growing. Fortunately, rootstocks that are um, not as susceptible has been a solution that has worked around the world. The glassy wing sharpshooter, look at that ugly little thing, uh, typically brings Pierce's disease. Uh, that's, it's a full, full stop killer. Um, this would be burn it and uh, hope to start over. You have grapevine moths that also introduce uh, disease. You've got an Australian grapevine. We have a European. There are more of these critters than just these two varieties. We also have spider mites, very similar to a phylloxera, but not as severe, where they just suck the life. Literally, they suck and drink the sap out of the leaves, out of the, the actual stems and everywhere. Um, but the spider mites, you can kill with soap water, right? They're not as terrible. It's just you got to find them, catch them early, and they procreate like crazy. So infestation is very easy. Then you have viruses, if that wasn't enough for the vine to be fighting against. Because uh, it's not like a cow or, to, you know, like a horse where they can shake a bug off. The, the vines just get landed on and then get subjected to the horror. So viruses, family virus from the dagger nematode, your two images of that. One is just it's starting on the left. You can see it's starting to take over. Uh, similar to chlorosis looking in nature is, again, yellow, isn't green, photosynthesis, grape formation, flowering, pollinate, all the things, right? So these little microscopic nematodes, you can't see them without one, uh, without your little magnifier, um, and they are the notorious for fan leaf. Then you have leaf roll virus by these little stinky mealy bugs. Um, fortunately, they too can be killed with soap water, but uh, you know, mealy bugs are fast and furious. They show up and they are sucking the life out of the plant and you get actually a virus uh, transmitted that rolls the leaves. Then we don't have just those things. So now we have even bigger issues to deal with. Birds, kangaroos, wild boar, deer, baboons in Africa, all sorts of great mammals that just come and take, take their shots at us, our poor little vine. Then we have smoke and fire, drought, hail, frost, freeze, flood, or just too much water, too much rain, but it's not a pure flood. Sunburn, all of that can kill a vine. So I hope you, and, and remember, like the vine itself is reliant on mother nature and us farmers to take care of them because there's not much they can do on their own. So we have one question as we close here is, you have money to buy site selection. You want to build a vineyard. Yeah. These are two live properties on the market. What I want to know is where would you put your money and why? So here is a property and this is in Washington state that's for sale. So I think you can see it looks like the land is fairly flat. Um, it looks like it's on a drier side. Um, I, you know, there's no address here. You can see there's some farm buildings available to us if we were to invest in this property. Or we have this property in Washington for sale. 
um, where we've got some sort of slope. It doesn't, I don't know how steep it is. It clearly gets cold winters um, and you see a body of water. So if you were gonna put money, I would say, which property would you pay more money for? Property A or property B? It would depend on the varietal that I was trying to grow. Or so, what you could afford and then choose the variety that you want to make, right? Okay. So in other words, like if this, if I only had money to afford this one, I probably am going to make very different wines. So for example, if I chose to buy this property, which is cheaper, uh, I am likely going to produce bulk wine, maybe high volume, very ripe, very fruity, right? Um, because I'm in a drier area. Uh, maybe this is less water. I don't know enough about it, but maybe I'm going to grow Grenache here. Um, but I'm going to end up not necessarily making uh, vo volume that I can age, right? I'm likely going to be making bulk wine or, you know, very affordable, like we call cheap and cheerful wines. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is substantial volume to be consumed by consumers who are paying money for it. This property, more money, uh, less farm equipment. I might have some investments. But the body of water suggests that I'm going to potentially protect from a frost or freeze. So, um, Jean-Marc, I saw property B. Yeah, I, I think this is listed for that reason at a higher price. We've got drainage, probably less fertile soil. The opportunity to grow maybe a more premium quality uh, grape and or make quality wine and maybe something that could be um, ageable, right? So um, that's everything in our one-hour time, Mark, breezing through the 101 on Man, it is hard to be a vine, harder than it looks anyway. Um, I hope you got something out of it. I hope everybody's learned at least one thing new or maybe got a study tip on how to remember something. But uh, I appreciate you all coming. Thank you so much for your questions and your time today. Uh, we have recorded the session, so if it would help friends of yours, um, feel free. We can share that link after. Thank you very much. This does help me if I continue on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>